Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello viewers, welcome to this next lecture on the NPTEL MOOC course on Mathematical Portfolio Theory. You would recall that uh, we had continued our discussion on the non-mean variance analysis in the last class where you talked about uh, semi-variance and semi-deviation and you looked at the portfolio analysis while using semi-variance or semi-deviation uh, de 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 as the measure of risk and accordingly we also extended this in case of the uh, capital market line and the security market line again replacing the standard deviation with the uh, semi deviation as the measure of risk. So, now in today's lecture and the next lecture uh, what we will do is that we will look at one another important concept in the non mean variance framework and that is what is known as the stochastic dominance and we will look at uh, three forms of stochastic dominance and today's lecture we will discuss in detail on the first uh, uh, order stochastic dominance. So, according to we start this lecture, uh, on the topic of uh, stochastic dominance criteria, uh, so this approach of stochastic dominance uh, can be formulated in accordance with different utility functions and you will explain this in details in the subsequent discussion. And uh, accordingly, what we do is that uh, we consider first, second and third order stochastic dominance. Okay, so, let me start with today's discussion that is on a first order stochastic dominance. Uh, so, the first order a stochastic dominance criteria Uh, so, we observe that which in a sense competes and extends the paradigm of the Markowitz mean variance framework. So, we have extensively looked at the Markowitz mean variance framework and now uh, we are going to introduce the first order stochastic dominance and uh, this should be viewed more as some sort of uh, extension of the mean variance framework while at the same time competing uh, with the notion of the mean variance framework. Okay, uh, so, the fact that uh, stochastic dominance encapsulates or captures more information of 
the probability distribution instead of only focusing on the mean and variance. So, instead of just being uh, restricted to mean and variance, stochastic dominance also focuses on uh, capturing more information about the probability distribution. All right. So, this fact results in this approach to portfolio selection namely stochastic dominance. becoming uh, more potentially useful in determining portfolios that could outperform Markowitz efficient portfolios. Right. Uh, so, this means that if you take this approach of portfolio selection, it potentially could end up uh, determining portfolios uh, that performs better than the portfolios on the efficient frontier that we saw using the Markowitz mean variance framework. Now, uh, this contrast that means, this uh, difference between the stochastic dominance portfolio and Markowitz mean variance portfolio could uh, become more visible or pronounced in case of non-normal distributions. Alright, so to motivate this, uh, what you do is that now we consider an example. So, uh, we take the probability distribution for three risky assets as given in the figure. So, let us look at how the probability distribution is going to look like. So, it is going to look something like this. On the x axis, we have returned as percentage and on the y axis, we have the respective probability. And then, uh, we consider, so let us consider the returns to be minus 10, minus 5 percent, 0 percent, 20 percent, 40 percent and 45 percent. Now, uh, we take this portfolio A uh, from, uh, from minus 10 to 20 percent. Uh, we take portfolio B. So, this is going to be my portfolio A. Uh, then portfolio B is uh, something that is going to be from uh, 0 to 40 percent. So, this is portfolio B and portfolio C is something from that will go from minus 5 to 45 percent. Okay. Uh, so, here the distribution is uh, assumed to be uniform. Uh, and we do this for simplicity of understanding, but uh, the argument to be used subsequently can be uh, applicable to other kinds of probability uh, distributions.
Okay, so now uh, we have this uniform distribution. So now you observe that in case of A, uh, portfolio A, it is a uniform distribution lying in the range minus 10 uh, to 20. In case of portfolio B, uh, this is a uniform distribution in the range 0 to 40 and in case of uh, C, it is going from minus 5 to 45. So, you remember that for a uniform distribution, the mean is going to be A plus B over 2. So, accordingly, the return on portfolio A is simply going to be minus 10 plus 20 over 2, which is 5 percent. Mu B ranges from 0 to 40. So, this average is going to be 0 to 40, 0 plus 40 over 2, which is 20 percent. So, this is mu B and expected return on C that is mu C this is going to be minus 5 plus 45 over 2 and this is also going to be 20 percent. And in a similar way uh, sigma A remember sigma A is going to be square root of B minus A whole square by 12. So, this is going to be 20 minus of minus 10 square over 12. So, this is going to be equal to 8.66 sigma b is going to be square root of 40 minus 0 square upon 12. So, this is going to be equal to 11.55 percent and sigma c uh, is going to be square root of 45 minus of minus 5 square over 12 and this turns out to be equal to 14.43 percent. So, mu is 5 percent, mu b is 20 percent, mu c is 20 percent, sigma is 8.66 percent, uh, sigma b is 11.55 percent and sigma c is 14.43 percent. Okay. So, what do you do now? We will look at this in the mu sigma plane. So, let us consider the mu sigma plane. So, in the mu sigma plane, uh, this is going to be the efficient frontier. And uh, say this is your uh, 5 percent and uh, this is your 20 percent. So, this portfolio here and on the x axis uh, sigma is uh, I take this to be 8.66 percent. So, this pair of 5 percent and 8.66 percent this is going to be portfolio A and uh, then for 11.55 uh, percent. And uh, so, I could have, so let me put this here, uh, this is 8.66 percent. Uh, let this point here be 11.55 percent and let this point here be 14.43 percent. So, I, I take this 11.55 uh, percent here and the corresponding mu to be 20 percent. So, mu 20 percent and sigma 11.55 percent uh, this is going to be portfolio B and the portfolio C is again going to be 20 percent uh, value for mu with 14.43 uh, percent for sigma. Uh, so, this is going to be my portfolio C. So, A is identified as uh, the one with mu 5 percent and uh, sigma 8.66 percent, B is the one with mu 20 percent and sigma 11.55 percent and C is the one again with mu 20 percent and uh, sigma 14.43 percent. So, this is basically uh, portfolios A, B, C in the sigma mu space. All right. So, now uh, what we are going to do is we are going to make a few observations out of this. So, here you observe that A and B lie on the efficient frontier. So, this means that these assets or portfolios A and B, these are mean variance efficient and C since it does not lie on the efficient frontier. So, this is going to be mean variance inefficient. So, this means that in the Markowitz framework only A uh, and B are going to be desirable and uh, C is not going to be desirable because C uh, is a portfolio that does not lie on the efficient frontier. 
All right. So, now this is one observation that we have made uh, from the point of view of the Mar Markowitz mean variance framework. The next observation that we make is that, uh, that uh, C however is more desirable than A in some situations. So, even though C is inefficient and A is efficient, even then C is going to be desirable, uh, more desirable than A in certain situations. Uh, so, for example, uh, to illustrate this situation, so what is going to be the probability that A earns less than minus 5 percent? This probability is going to be 1 over 6, but what is the probability that C earns less than uh, minus 5 percent? So, that is going to be 0. So, you see the probability uh, that C uh, falls below 5 per minus 5 percent uh, is actually uh, this probability is less than the probability that uh, A falls below minus 5 percent. So, that means that uh, C actually is performing better than A uh, in the scenario that the returns are falling below minus 5 percent. Now, another scenario uh, could be that uh, probability that uh, the portfolio A earns less than 0 percent. So, in this case this is going to be equal to one third, but the same probability uh, that C earns less than 0 percent this is going to be equal to 1 over 10. So, again you know the probability that A earns the negative return one third and this is equal to one third and that is actually higher than uh, the probability of C earning a negative return which in this case is going to be 1 10. So, in terms of you know these are two specific examples where you see that under certain circumstances if you set the criteria whether your uh, uh, portfolio return can fall, fall below minus 5 percent or whether it can fall below 0 percent. In both the scenarios we see that uh, C even though it is not an efficient uh, portfolio, but A is even then C can actually be more desirable than A in that particular context. All right. Uh, so, one more observation uh, that I want to make and uh, that is, uh, so the third observation that I want to make here is that. Uh, in case investors uh, prefer more to less, C is more desirable than A even though C is inefficient. All right. So, now let us uh, look at what is going to be the cumulative distribution of asset returns for each case. Uh, so, remember that uh, A is uniformly distributed in the range minus 10 to 20, uh, B is uniformly distributed in the range 0 to 40 and uh, C is uniformly distributed in the range minus 5 to 45. All right. So, let us identify this point. So, I, ha I have a minus 10 here, then I have minus 5, then I have 20, we have a 40 and we have a 45. And uh, here uh, on the y axis we have a cumulative probability. Uh, the maximum can be 1. So, for uh, portfolio A, the, the it is basically the cumulative probability will be this straight line from minus 10 all the way to uh, 20. Uh, now, in case of B, it, it goes from uh, 0 to 40. So, the 40 is going to be here. So, from 0 to 40, the graph is going to look like this and C is from minus 5 to 45. So, 45 is here. So, I start off with uh, minus 5 and then I go all the way to 45. So, this is A 
uh, this is going to be B and this is going to be C. So, this is the cumulative distribution. All right. Uh, so, now uh, we can make uh, an, some observation. So, you see that in the observation that uh, for the range of possible returns for each case, the cumulative probability that the return of asset A is less than a specific return is greater than the cumulative probability that the return of asset C is less than the same specific return. Uh, so, what it means is that uh, if you look at the entire range of values, then the cumulative probability that means the value on the y axis uh, and you know that cumulative probability basically gives you the probability of uh, the random variable taking a value less than or equal to certain value. So, we take that uh, to be the threshold value. So, if we fix the certain threshold value, then the probability or the cumulative probability of the returns being below that certain threshold level in case of A. And if you look at the cumulative probability of C of certain threshold, that same threshold, and you compare these two cumulative probabilities of the returns being below that certain threshold, you will observe that this cumulative probability in case of the asset A is going to be greater than that of the asset C, because you observe here that the, the graph A or the cumulative probability distribution always lies above C. Uh, so, accordingly we can say that this means that C is more desirable than A. So, because the probability of falling be below a certain threshold is consistently higher uh, than uh, in case of A as compared to C. Uh, so, obviously, for that certain threshold, the loss likelihood as given by the probability or the equivalent to the cumulative probability is going to be less in case of C and that is why from a loss avoiding point of view, C is going to be more desirable than your asset A. Okay. Uh, however, a, if you go back and observe carefully, so now you see that in case of A, this is very clearly distinguishable in case of A and C. But uh, and in a similar manner, if you compare A and B, uh, so similarly B is more desirable uh, than A. But since there is a uh, intersection of uh, B and C, so no such uh, clear desirability uh, exists between B and C. Okay, so, now it is time to just uh, recall the notation for cumulative distribution that you had obtained you know at the beginning of the course. So, the notation f of r and I am using r to indicate that we are looking at uh, the return random variable. This probability, so this is the probability that x less than or equal to r and this in the continuous time framework, this is integral of f of x dx, which is where f of x is the probability uh, density function of x at the integral going from minus infinity to t. And accordingly, uh, we now begin our discussion on first order stochastic dominance. So, F s d 
uh, with an illustrative example. All right. Uh, so, now what we do is that uh, we are going to look at the graphs of the probability uh, density function. So, uh, so we consider uh, first the graph of the probability density function and uh, on the x axis we have the return and the y axis we have the probability. So, here uh, we have the probability density function of B and uh, then we have the probability density function of A. And the corresponding uh, cumulative uh, probabilities, so for that again we have the return on the x axis and cumulative probability on the y axis. So, on the top we have uh, uh, the cumulative distribution of B and below that we have the cumulative distribution of A. All right. So, now what you can do is uh, we can make an observation here that so you observe that here we have the distribution F B and F A uh, where F A is slightly to the right of F B and consequently what you have is that the cumulative distribution of F B. Uh, is consistently going to be at a higher level than the cumulative distribution of F A. So, this graphical representation of the specific case is something uh, which will uh, motivate our discussion on uh, stochastic dominance. So, we now make the following observation that the cumulative distribution for asset A as you have already seen in the graph, this lies below that for asset B for any given level of return. Uh, so, it accordingly it is said that asset A is more desirable than asset B in FSD that is first order stochastic dominance. Uh, so, therefore, based on the premise or the assumption that investors uh, prefer more wealth to less or more returns to than less uh, that is mathematically it is u prime of r greater than 0. Asset A is said to dominate asset B if and only if, so it is a two way condition, you have F A of R being less than or equal to F B of R as seen in the graph. So, that is uh, F A of R minus F B of R being less than or equal to 0 for all R and uh, with the strict inequality that is F A R being strictly less than uh, F B of R happening in case of at least one value. So, at one of the, at, at least one point of R uh, in the interval A B the strict inequality must hold and where your A and B represent the lower and upper bound on the return r, the random variable r 
which is the return respectively. So, let us now give uh, an interpretation of what we have uh, discussed so far. So, the first interpretation is the following that uh, all monotonic non increasing uh, non decreasing rather utility. So, I should write for all monotonic non decreasing utility functions. Uh, that means, where we have u prime of r greater than 0, the expected utility from A is no less than from B for all investors irrespective of their risk attitude. Uh, so, mathematically this means that the expected utility of, of uh, all investors in case of the first asset or the return of the first asset. So, uh, expected utility A of R is going to be greater than or equal to expected utility in case of B. And the second interpretation uh, that we have here is that irrespective of the nature of utility functions being used. f a of r less than or equal to f b of r means that the expected return of asset a is greater than or equal to the expected return of asset B that is E A of R is greater than or equal to E B of R. So, we now give the proof of uh, F S D or the first order stochastic dominance. Uh, so, accordingly what you do is that we first identify uh, the expected utility of each asset. So, the definition are as follows the expected utility of return on the first asset this by definition of expectation is going to be u of r into d f of a r uh, in the interval a b. So, that is the range of your returns and e of u of r b in a similar manner this is going to be integral of u of r d f b of r from a to b with f a and f b being the respective cumulative distribution with uh, as I have said the range of returns is a, a b. So, you have the cumulative distribution uh, d f of a and d f of b and then you have the utility u of r. So, uh, the expected utility in the first case will involve this integral with respect to the cumulative distribution f a and in the second case it is going to be with respect to the cumulative distribution f b. So, we now have settled down in what the expected utilities are in case of a and b. So, two generic portfolios a and b. So, now we come to uh, what is known as the dominance. Uh, 
uh, so accordingly asset A is said to dominate asset B and remember that this is in the context of uh, FSD and this uh, domination is defined as if the expected utility of the return of asset A is greater than the expected utility of return from B. That is in other words we say that A dominates B in the sense of FSD if integral A to B of E of R. So, I am just using the definition of expected utility done previously d f a of r this is greater than integral a to b u of r d f b of r uh, that is we can write this as integral a to b u of r into d of f a r minus f b r and this is greater than 0. So, we can use either this form or this equivalent form. All right. So, now uh, using integration by parts, what we will have? So, we will have u expected value of uh, utility of R a minus E of u R b. This is going to be integral a to b u of r uh, d of f a of r minus f b of r. If you if you use the integration by part, so we see that uh, so we will get this as the first function and we will take this as the second function. So, it is first function u of r into integral of second which is f a r minus f b r in the range a to b minus integral of derivative of the first function that is u prime of r into integral of the second function that is f a of r minus f b of r into d r uh, and this integral is from a to b. Uh, so, this is now uh, simply going to be uh, equal to. So, now here we just make the observation uh, regarding this term. So, now uh, since f a of b is equal to f b of b is equal to 1. So, remember that uh, b is the uh, largest value of the return. So, this uh, it is the cumulative value is going to be equal to 1 and accordingly uh, similarly f a of a is equal to f b of a this is going to be equal to 0. So, this means that uh, since this is this holds therefore, the first term is 0. Uh, hence, we can conclude uh, that integral of a to b u of r d of f a of r minus f b of r uh, this is going to be just the remaining term after integration by part. So, this is minus a to b uh, the integral of minus, uh, minus of integral a to b u prime of r f a of r minus f b of r dr. Now, since u prime of r is greater than 0 and f a of r is less than or equal to f b of r and the inequality strict inequality holds in one case. Therefore, this integral a to b u of r d of f a r minus f b r this is going to be greater than 0. And since this integral uh, you will remember this is nothing but expected value of u of r a minus expected value of u of r b uh, this is greater than 0. So, that means that it is because of this condition we have been able to arrive at this condition uh, in terms of the expectation to uh, show the first order stochastic dominance. Okay, uh, so, what I want to do is now uh, I want to do uh, another proof and this is the proof for 
f a of r less than or equal to f b of r being equivalent to E A of R greater than or equal to E B of R for positive R. Uh, and we just make a note uh, before we start the proof that uh, replacing R with 1 plus R does not impact the argument. So, this is just to accommodate the case that uh, uh, mathematically one uh, r can be actually between 0 to minus 1 also. Okay, so, uh, in order to prove this, uh, so we without loss of generality in order to prove this we uh, still assume r is greater than 0. Uh, so, accordingly we have the definition of E of R and what is this going to be? It is going to be integral of R d f of R uh, as per the definition of expectation 0 to infinity remember that your R is positive and instead of 0 to infinity we take that this integral from 0 to n with the limit that n tends to infinity. Uh, so, again uh, using integration by parts what do we get? So, we look at this integration. So, when you are doing integration by parts. So, we will look at integral 0 to n of uh, r d f of r. So, I take r to be the first function and f, uh, f d f as the second function. So, it is first function r into second uh, integral of the second function f of r from 0 to n minus integral of 0 to n of derivative of first function which is 1 into integral of second that is f of r dr. So, here uh, this is going to be n into f of n of course, the second term is going to be 0 minus integral 0 to n f of r dr. Now, what you can do is that we can add and subtract one term. So, that is minus n. So, I will have minus n minus 1 of into 1 minus f of n and accordingly here I will have plus 1 minus f of r dr integral 0 to n. So, you see here we from this term I will have minus n and this integral dr of uh, uh, from 0 to n is n and they cancel out. So, I, I add a minus n here and plus n here. Okay, now that we have this form, so let us now focus on this first term. So, however, n into 1 minus f of n, what is this going to be? So, this is going to be equal to n into integral n to infinity of f of r dr. Okay? So, this is 1 over f of n. So, it is 1 minus cumulative uh, distribution from 0 to n. Uh, so, this means that this is 1 minus f of n is nothing but what happens from n to infinity. So, accordingly this is going to be an integral from n to infinity of f of r dr. Now, you remember that here uh, what we have done is that uh, so, here we take the r as in this case you know since the integral is from n to infinity. So, obviously, your uh, r is going to be greater than n that means n is less than r. So, then I can write this as integral since n is less than r. So, I can write this as integral n to infinity r f of r dr and this is going to be equal to 0 as your n tends to infinity. So, that means that we have been able to get rid of this first term here and the only thing that remains is the second term. Uh, so, therefore, what I can say is that so looking at the above relation therefore, a limit n of 1 minus f of n is going to be equal to 0. 
So, this term is equal to 0 as your n tends to infinity and hence uh, the integration, this integration which is the expectation of r, this simply becomes this expression as n tends to infinity. So, integral 0 to infinity 1 minus f of r dr. Therefore, this implies that if f a of r is less than or equal to f b of r, then we can use this relation to show that E a of r is going to be greater than or equal to E b of r for positive r. Uh, so, for this all you have to do is you uh, essentially take this uh, definition of E a of r and E b of r here and you subtract them and that will become the integral uh, involving these two and using this property you can show that this relation holds. Okay. So, in, uh, in finality, we have the following equivalent statements. One is that asset A dominates asset B in FSD, this is equivalent to uh, the basic concept that F A of R is less than or equal to F B of R, uh, where R belongs to some range A B and this is equivalent to that the return of asset A is equal in distribution to return of asset B plus V tilde, where a random variable v tilde is greater than or equal to 0. And here I have introduced a new notation equal superscript uh, dist. So, this notation means that R a and R b plus v tilde are what is known as equal in distribution. Uh, so, let me conclude by one example to illustrate FSD. So, let us consider the probabilities of two assets A and B. So, let the probability and the returns of asset A. So, the returns could be 4, 5, 7, 8 each with identical probability of 1 over 4. And in case of asset B, the returns could be 3, 4, 6, 7, again each with identical probability of 1 by 4, 1 by 4, 1 by 4 and 1 by 4. So, from here what you get is uh, we will get the cumulative probabilities. So, for this we have to look at what are the possible values of returns. So, the possible values of returns are 3, uh, then we have 4, then 5, then we have 6, then we have 7 and then 8. And what is going to be the cumulative probability of uh, x less than or equal to x? So, in case of A what is this going to be and in case of B what is this going to be? So, uh, in case of A, these values are going to be a 0, 1 by 4, 2 by 4, 2 by 4, 3 by 4 and 1 and in case of B, this is going to be 1 by 4, 2 by 4, 2 by 4, 3 by 4, 1 and 1. Okay, so, now we have the cumulative probabilities for both A and B. So, now you observe that the cumulative probability of R A, all right, so that means these values is no greater 
then that of R B uh, that is given in this column for any value of return. So, observe carefully that here 0 is less than 1 by 4, 1 by 4 is less than 2 by 4. So, th this is less than this is uh, so, this is strictly less than strictly less than equal to strictly less than strictly less than equal to. So, you see that in each case uh, the cumulative probability is either strictly for A is either strictly less than that of B or uh, is equal to that of B. So, that means that at under no circumstance the cumulative probability of A can exceed that of uh, the cumulative probability of B. So, that means that if you draw the graph of capital F A of R and F B of R then F B of R uh, is always going to be either uh, coinciding with F B of R or going to be uh, below F B of R. So, uh, in accordance with the first order stochastic, def uh, stochastic dominance definition that we have already done, we can conclude that thus asset A dominates asset B in F S T. All right. Uh, so, this brings us to the conclusion of this lecture. Uh, in this lecture, what we did is that we started off uh, extending the concept of the mean variance framework and what we did is that we started looking at uh, what is going to be the definition of the stochastic uh, dominance and we observed that uh, the stochastic dominance can be of first, second or third order and in today's class we just discussed uh, the first order stochastic dominance and we explained this from the point of view of that that a portfolio A dominates a portfolio B if the cumulative distribution of F of A uh, uh, for asset A uh, will be less than or equal to the cumulative distribution for the returns of asset B, F, B of R. And we what we did is that we looked at two proofs uh, in terms of uh, the expected values and in terms of the utility. So, in the next class we will continue our discussion and complete uh, the second order stochastic dominance and the third order stochastic dominance. Thank you for watching.